Calls to order. Submission of writings to the Roman censor. In a word, a system. The council disintegrated all that. Vatican II, the Ecumenical Revolution. John the Twenty Third insisted that he had been led to convoke the new council by a supernatural inspiration. Symbolically, opening the window of his apartments, he indicated his will that the church, at the council, open herself to the world and undertake her aggiornamento, her updating. His two immediate predecessors had already considered calling a council but with greater circumspection. Pius XII considered the possibility, but twenty years before, in May 1923, Pius XI had gathered the cardinals of the Roman Curia in a secret consistory to seek their advice on the timeliness of a general council. At the time, the idea was ill-received. Cardinal Vio spoke for them all. The most serious reason the one which seems to me an absolute argument for responding in the negative. The reopening of a council is desired by the worst enemies of the church, namely the modernists, who according to the most reliable evidence, are already preparing to take advantage of the estates general of the church, to launch a revolution, a new 1789, object of their hopes and dreams. We fear lest they introduce methods of discussion and of propaganda more in conformity with democracy than with the traditions of the Church. Cardinal Bio, who has been called the greatest theologian of the 20th century, ended with a categorical affirmation. The age of councils had been brought to a close with the definition of papal infallibility. These men were aware that the Church was being infiltrated by modernists, how, in the space of four years, was the church to reject the doctrine of two millennia, still echoed by the preparatory schemata, and find herself at the end in such perfect harmony with the religion of man made God? Therein lies the history of the conciliar revolution, which is not without resemblance to the French Revolution. To carry off a successful revolution on the model of the Revolution of 1789, prior agreements have to be reached, and men of confidence have to be put in the right position. The three packs and the infiltrators. There has to be a mastermind, Rahner. There has to be a Magna Carta, religious liberty, collegiality, ecumenism. There must also be an engine of war set in motion, by a key, a magic word to energize and set in motion the entire revolution. That key word was pronounced by the liturgist Dom Lambert Bedouin, when he prophesied that Roncalli, once elected pope, would be able to call a council and consecrate ecumenism. Number 1. The Light Motive of the Peaceful Revolution Vatican II wanted to consecrate the opening of the Church to the world. Now, the world of the 1960s was marked by profound political and moral changes. No more war, peace at any price, economic development, liberation from taboos, the hippie movement, culminating in the student protests of May 1968. The Church, too, would have her peaceful revolution as she came into harmony with the world. The aging, good Pope John, longed to bring about a revolution in the Church under the banner of aggiornamento and openness to the world. No more condemnations! No more anathemas! Let us extend a new message of optimism to the world reaching out to us. Let us rediscover our lost unity. Vatican II would finally erase Fifteen centuries of heresy and schism, throwing the past in the rubbish bin and acting as though nothing had happened, ever moving toward a more perfect fraternity. For what motive? For the motive and in the name of ecumenism. At what price? At any price. 
The church wanted, at all costs, to establish peace with the world under the standard of ecumenism. With such a wedge set at the heart of the conciliar preoccupations, it would be possible to break apart the entire church. Ecumenism means universality or Catholicity. The ecumenical effort signifies the work to promote the universality of the church, the Catholic Church. It was the wish of our Lord in the prayer after the Last Supper, that they may be one. We have sufficiently described the modernist ecumenism of Rahner to be able to understand the equivocacy which might slip into this traditional term. For modernists, undaunted in the face of contradiction, all churches are true. Their differences are measured only in degree. The Catholic religion is true, but only a little more so than the others. The ghetto church of the Vatican ought to open her doors to rediscover unity, lost more or less by her own fault. In other words, ever since the emergence of schisms and heresies, the Catholic Church has lacked the marks of unity and universality, which have traditionally argued her veracity. It is interesting that the enemies of the Church do not mention her sanctity and apostolicity, the two other marks of the true Church, Evidently, they are much less ecumenical than the others. Neither Luther, nor Calvin, nor any other heresiarch shone particularly by his sanctity. Moreover, none of them can claim to have received an apostolic mission from Christ to sow subversion and schism in his own church. The later generations of modernists concentrate rather on the unity of the church, and, in this, they are quite correct. Indeed, unity is the one mark which defines essentially the Catholic Church and the source of her cohesion. The other marks are also proper to the Church, but they do not define her essentially or properly. This unity is triple, including unity of government, of faith, and of sacraments. It is precisely here that the question becomes more complicated for the false ecumenists. They would square the circle and reconcile contraries. Now, there are three ways of uniting elements which differ from one another. They can be transformed into a new reality, according to the proverb, salve et coagula, dissolve and unite. One might also preserve a common core while dissolving the differences. Finally, one might choose to let them peacefully coexist respecting the differences of each. The first case represents the church of the future, Teilhard's vision, which, according to him, is unimaginable and indescribable. However, this metamorphosis of all religions would sign the death warrant of the Church of Christ, since it would annihilate above all her unity of government. On the other hand, the unity of faith and of sacraments would be destroyed in the second case with a vague union of religions. The result would be a centripetal church, in which the differences would be downplayed and the common points underlying to produce a sort of charter of united religions, which would serve as a backbone to the whole. This pretended union would thus be founded on the lowest common denominator, or else on a common dogma or quite simply, on a common impulsion toward the divinity. However, the wish to establish a common and universal religion is as absurd as believing in a god who is at once the Holy Trinity, Allah, Buddha, and the Dalai Lama. It is evident that the truths of the faith, such as the Trinity and the incarnation of Jesus Christ, would then be reduced to symbols and ultimately to chimeras in which no one placed any significant belief. Such is probably the type of religion of which dreamed Schleiermacher and Terrell. There is a third image sought by the ecumenists at Vatican II. It is the Pantheon Church, the Tower of Babel of religions, infinitely wide and varied. It does indeed seem that the conciliars envisioned a real but 
flexible union of all religions, an amalgam of beliefs and a mutually enriching respect for the differences of each. This third option is Rahner's open, pluralist church. Sadly, far from representing a satisfying solution, it labors under the difficulties of the two previous churches put together. The structure of the church and the faith are both destroyed, for truth is, if it were possible, even less diversified than the Roman scaffolding of the church. It is exclusive. It admits of no degree and suffers no contradiction. The ecumenists, responsible for the making of Vatican II, and for its undoing, had to distort words and realities before the open, pluralist church could be accepted. Only with abundance of ambiguities and behind-the-scenes maneuvering did they succeed in passing off to the Council Fathers the identity of contraries. The Church of Jesus Christ is only the Catholic Church, and is not only the Catholic Church. Truth in matters of religion is the Catholic faith alone, and is not the Catholic faith alone. The grace of Jesus Christ is received exclusively through the Catholic Church, and it is not received exclusively through her. Or else, if they did not identify contraries, they relativized them, portraying one church to be as good as another, one faith as true as another. These two means, contradiction and relativism, lead to absolute skepticism. Nothing is true since everything and its contrary is true. So it is that the Council was only able to implement the incoherent charter of ecumenism by sacrificing the principles of reason and faith. In good logic, such an opinion leads straight into the perfect intellectual and religious nirvana, which is the very essence of modernism. Moreover, since this conciliar ecumenism is itself founded on philosophical skepticism and doctrinal relativism, we are led to conclude that it is indeed the practical application of modernism. With this in mind, there is no better illustration of the ravages of modernism than to see our leaders struggling in vain to make ecumenism work. Finally disillusioned, Paul VI declared at the end of his life, The difficulties to re-establishing a real Unitarian fusion of the various Christian denominations are such as to paralyze all human hope that it can be realized historically. The ruptures that have taken place have ossified, solidified, and organized themselves in such a way as to characterize as utopian all attempts to reconstruct independency on the head, which is Christ, a body, as St. Paul writes, joined and knit together. This text reveals more than the Pope's dream of combining all the Christian churches. It reveals that he had not yet understood that an enterprise to unite contraries is quite simply absurd. Only a mind tainted by modern evil could desire at all costs the squaring of the circle. Such is, nonetheless, the amalgam sought by Vatican II, which declared that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, Another way of saying that the Catholic Church is no longer the exclusive Church of Jesus Christ. Only recently, Cardinal Ratzinger gave a perfect explanation of the weight of this text, recognizing the ineluctable contradiction, yet without overreacting. However, the difference between subsisit and est represents the tragedy of ecclesiastical divisions. Although the Church is but one and subsists in a single subject, ecclesial realities exist outside of the subject. Veritable local churches and diverse ecclesial communities. Since sin is a contradiction, we cannot, in the last analysis, fully resolve from a logical point of view the discrepancy between subsisit and est. If we analyze the text, it is easy enough to see that the Council was only a ratification of false ecumenism, a la Rahner. It affirmed that the separate churches are not without their value in the mystery of salvation, 
since the Church of Christ does not disdain to use them as instruments of salvation. To Congar, friend of Rahner, do we owe the scheme of Lumen Gentium, which, with its famous subsisit, claims that the separate churches belong to the Church of Christ. Pure heresy! Small wonder if equivocacy of terminology was rampant at the Council, where the traditional magisterium dealt with the nature of the church, Congar spoke instead of the mystery of the church, where Pius XII consecrated the notion of member of the mystical body of Christ. Congar inserted Terrell's vague notion of communion of the people of God. Why? Because one is or is not a member of a body, but one can be more or less in communion. Vatican II hastened to render explicit the multiple reasons uniting us to non-Catholics. The Holy Scripture, belief in the Holy Trinity, baptism, the Eucharist, devotion to Mary, union in the Holy Ghost, martyrdom. The fragility of these multiple reasons need scarcely be proved when we know that the Orthodox refuse the magisterium of the Church and the interpretation of Holy Scripture and that the Protestants reject devotion to Mary. Seeing only the positive side of a heresy means failing to understand that the element of truth is not the animating force in a false doctrine, but rather the slave to the element of error. The true mode of operation of conciliar ecumenism is to hide the truth. It is like the doctor who, by charity, would spare the cancer of his patient under the pretext that the evil may well be of good faith. We will see where ecumenism was to lead under John Paul II, not only hiding the truth, but making it serve as an instrument in the propagation of the air of religious syncretism. Number 2. The Devil's Spoon Cardinal Suenins declared that one could draw up an impressive list of theses taught at Rome before the Council as exclusively true and which were eliminated by the Council Fathers. Obviously, the 2,400 Fathers who had arrived from around the world were, at the beginning of the Council, united by the same doctrine, the same love for our Lord, and the same will to labor for the conversion of souls. How, then, can these same bishops have ultimately proclaimed something other than the perpetual doctrine of the Church? The project of ecumenism was an open invitation to the devil. There is a proverb which says, If you want to dine with the devil, you had better use a long spoon. What spoon did the devil use to hoodwink all of the bishops at once? The same as he used in 1789. An historian of the French Revolution, Augustine Cochin, puzzled over the baffling incapacity of the government of Louis the Sixteenth, to react against the revolution. His response to the question sheds light for us on the methods employed at the council. He explained that the ideas of the revolution managed to penetrate contemporary minds unchecked thanks to societies of thought, the equivalent of our modern pressure groups. These societies, whatever their particularities, all had the same basic characteristics, the exclusion of any effective activity, and thus of any reality check, the quest for unity at any cost in spite of differences of opinion, the method of dialogue. Vatican II, like the societies of thought, was carried out by ideologists. The essential characteristic of these demagogical societies is their lack of finality and realism, we would say, their lack of pastoral vision. Yet, was not Vatican II touted precisely as a pastoral council? Yes, if the word signifies ambiguous, indecisive, refusing to define anything infallibly. No, if the word means seeking to resolve concrete problems. All of the previous councils, even the most dogmatic, had been eminently pastoral because they preserved the faith of the flock while condemning particular heresies. Pastoral activity 
had a precise goal, that of addressing current problems faced by Catholics, and it did not have time to concoct ambiguous declarations to please other religions. Vatican II was notoriously indecisive from the outset. What was meant by a council with no precise goal apart from opening to the world? Was it not tempting the Holy Ghost to proclaim his intervention in a meeting which had no real reason for being? Did it not amount to giving the modernist carte blanche to fill the void? Cardinal Siri actually considered that some prelates had come to the council specifically intending to lead the church into Protestantism by eliminating tradition and papal primacy. Moreover, what could be more vague than a great missionary movement towards souls in general, than wanting to address a theoretical modern man? Ecumenism claimed to open the church to the world and address global issues, but it remained general and abstract, far from the realism of true shepherds of the flock. Thus, in the name of aggiornamento, the Council Fathers undertook to examine every aspect of the life of the Church, a colossal undertaking and obviously beyond their competence. It seems, too, that the less one knows about a subject, the more tempting it is to oversimplify and adopt definitions of a false and ultimately simplistic clarity. In such conditions, it was not difficult for them to be carried away by an enlightened minority. A second point proper to the ideological societies is their quest for unity at any price. A consensus must be obtained, whether it's true or not. Monsignor Zala, among many others, confessed at Fulda that such had also been the principal preoccupation in the aula, the objective which the Commission on the Liturgy held most at heart in examining the amendments of the Council Fathers was to develop a text sure to obtain the assent of two-thirds of the conciliar assembly. Unfortunately, the vote, ill-used, is not a recipe for truth but for accommodation. During the Council, voting was ubiquitous. There was voting at every level, at preparatory episcopal conferences, and the commissions, in the aula, and finally in the general sessions, where there were 538 distinct votes. The sheer quantity of votes tended to discourage the recalcitrant, such that the most controversial schemata were opposed in the end only by a tiny minority. The means to ecumenical union is the democratic combinazione, ambiguity, the path of least resistance, at the expense of truth. As an example, Cardinal Ottaviani confided that, at the Council, equivocation was used and largely prevailed. We would cite a hundred cases of such ambiguity, which was in fact premeditated, as Father Laurentin explained. Here and there, ambiguity was cultivated as an escape from inextricable oppositions. One could lengthen the list of such wordings encompassing opposing tendencies, because they could be looked at from both sides, just like those photographic tricks whereby you see two different people in the same picture, depending on the angle you look at it. For this reason, Vatican II already has given, and will continue to give rise to many controversies. The method of consensus is dialogue. Dialogue automatically gives rise to three things. Selection, for any group is profane compared to a group of initiates. The adhesion of all members to general and emotionally loaded ideas. Conformity to the opinions of the group, even at the expense of reality and truth. Jean Guitton, French journalist and a great friend of Pope Paul VI, explains that when two men of different convictions dialogue with the idea of finally coming to an understanding, their procedure is first to delimit the zones of agreement, and then to extend them as much as possible. The ecumenical method consists in such dialogues. 
Obviously, dialogue is the appropriate method when the two parties seeking a resolution are on the same footing. How, then, can Catholics engage in serious dialogue to seek the truth, knowing that they already possess it fully? We do not read in the Gospel that Jesus Christ ever commanded us to enter into a dialogue with the pagans, but rather to teach them and convert them. However, the mentality of ecumenical dialogue reigns supreme in the conciliar Allah. A text is not ecumenical simply because it exposes the truth. The schema does not constitute a progress toward dialogue with non-Catholics, but is rather an obstacle to it, worse yet, a prejudice. If the schemata of the theological commission are not rewritten, we will be responsible for the Second Vatican Council's destruction of a great and immense hope. To which Monsignor Carly replied, Apparently, some would have us make no mention of tradition, or of the Blessed Virgin, on account of the Protestants, of primacy, on account of the Eastern Church, of atheism, in order to keep out of politics, of the moral order, so as not to alienate modern man. Rubbing elbows with non-Catholic observers at the refreshment stand, jokingly nicknamed Bar Jonah, give a strong ecumenical dimension all by itself. A Catholic theologian pointed out that if Rome were to print in red all the passages in the conciliar documents modified in connection with commentaries uttered by non-Catholic observers, it would make a very colorful volume. The fathers were also abandoned to the influence of opinion, in particular that of the ubiquitous press to such an extent that John the Twenty Third spoke of the Council of the Journalists. These journalists considered themselves to be the spokesmen of the laity. They issued marching orders or anathemas to influence the fathers, who were terrified of being labeled the fundamentalist. Under the united action of Catholic innovators, Protestants and laymen, St. Peter's Basilica became a giant pressure cooker, quickly and profoundly transforming the mindset of the Catholic leadership of the entire planet. Dialogue quickly gave way to the tyranny of the most organized group with its own carefully prepared agenda. The council soured. Vatican II metaphor foes into a vulgar concilial boom. Number three, the Pax and the coup d'etat. The French Revolution did not simply explode one fine spring day at Versailles. It had been prepared long before by means of secret pacts. It was masterfully conducted by a band of brigands, united by the tennis court oath, swearing to topple the throne. They managed to put in place, in perfect illegality, the structure responsible for the most revolutionary laws, which succeeded each other at a lightning pace. Precisely the same thing occurred at Vatican II. In deliberately styling the council as pastoral and ecumenical. The Pope meant to offer to the world a unity which Vatican I had not managed to obtain. To this end, Rome signed before the Council the Triplice Pacto Previo, the Triple Prior Agreement, with the Jewish Freemasons of the Bernai Brith, the Communists, and the Protestants. The Rome-Moscow Agreement was concluded at Metz on August 18, 1962, between the Patriarch Nicodemus, the KGB's right-hand man, and Cardinal Tisserand. The latter had received the injunction from John XXIII to sit down for talks at any price, as well as formal orders not only to negotiate an agreement, but also to verify its exact execution during the Council. So it was that all the numerous petitions called for the condemnation of communism found themselves classified deep within a Roman drawer. Vatican II, with its claims to read the signs of the times and glorify the church of the poor, managed to pass over in silence the single most important event of the 20th century and so abandon a hundred million unhappy victims of Luciferian communism. Might not the spirit of the council be the silent demon of the gospel? It is equally painful 
to see the complacency of John the Twenty Third toward the Jews. In 1963, a dispatch arrived from Washington addressed by Dr. Label Carts, president of the Binai Brith. He had been encouraged by Cardinal Bea to send his desiderata, a declaration which would affirm the responsibility of all humanity for the death of Christ, removing all responsibility from the Jewish people. The same scenario was repeated with the Protestants, again by the intermediary of Cardinal Bea. In July 1965, the Ecumenical Council of Churches presented a document expressing seven fundamental requirements of the Protestants in the matter of religious liberty. Four months later emerged the conciliar declaration Dignitatis Humanae, satisfying every one of these requests. These agreements, signed with the enemies of the Church, the same who were later present at the Council as observers, represent a first step toward revolution. They were only the beginning. During the preparatory meetings, an active minority, working to bend the meaning of the text, had already begun to make itself heard. Modernism was already strongly represented by the very men who would make and unmake the council. Cardinals Leinert, Dopfner, Bea, Frings, Alfrink, Leger, Koenig, and Richard. Of the twenty, preparatory schemata, not one remained except the insidious text on the liturgy. The council therefore opened without an agenda, without the least preparation, at the mercy of the first comer. The revolutionary spirit watched and waited in the minds of certain men, determined to seize the wheel of the council the moment it began. It was embodied by those who swore their tennis coat oath. Jean Guitton, recounts an anecdote whose source was Cardinal Tisserant. He showed me a painting. It shows six or seven porporati around their president, who is Tisserant. This is an historic painting, or rather symbolic. It represents the meeting we had before the opening of the council, at which we decided to block the first session by refusing the tyrannical rules established by John the Twenty-Third. These rules require the members to vote on the very first day to elect the members of the various commissions. Naturally, many conservative members of the preparatory commission were likely to be elected on account of their universally recognized competence. Their election was precisely what the modernists wanted to avoid at all costs in order to put their own men of confidence in these key positions. Cardinal Leinert was the protagonist of that tragic day. October 13th, 1962. Against the explicit will of the Pope, he took the microphone and asked that the vote be delayed. His suggestion received wild applause from the assembly. As he left the session, which had lasted barely 20 minutes, he was met with a cry of Allons en France de Patrie! Ah, you Frenchmen! After this little coup d'etat, the revolutionary part of the European alliance strode from victory to victory. The journalist priest, Ralph Wilkin, made an impressive list of them in his evocatively titled book, The Rhine Flows Into the Tiber. October 16, 1962. The European alliance carries off a majority of conciliar commissions in the elections. October 22, 1962. Priority is given to the liberal schema on the liturgy which would set the tone for the other conciliar documents. November 14th through the 22nd, 1962. The schema on the sources of revelation is rejected, blocked by the liberals who, refusing tradition, adopt the Lutheran sola scriptura. December 1962, and the end of the first session. No schema has been approved revelatory of a strong opposition toward the spirit of the preparatory commission. End of 1963. The schema on the Blessed Virgin is included in the schema on the Church. Absolutely no mention is made of her title as Mediatrix of All Graces, Judge Non-Ecumenical. September 30th through October 6th, 1964. The discussion of the schema on divine revelation, in which the problem of the two sources was skillfully avoided. 
October 20th through November 10th, 1964. The liberal, naturalistic schema on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, is accepted. November 20th, 1964. The decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, is accepted. October 28th, 1965. Promulgation of the Declaration on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae. November 15th, 1965. Summary approval of the scheme on marriage, whose wording leaves open the question of the use of artificial birth control. It was finally amended in extremis by Paul VI to eliminate the ambiguities. Number four, the mastermind. Wiltgen, in speaking of the European alliance, already strongly supported by the French cardinals, highlights above all the dictatorship of the German element. Since the position of the German language bishops was regularly adopted by the European alliance, and the position of the alliance was more often than not adopted by the council. It might only take one theologian's convincing the German language bishops of his point of view for the entire council to change its position. Such a theologian existed. His name was Karl Rahner. In principle, Father Rahner was merely the personal theologian of Cardinal Koenig. In fact, many members of the German and Austrian hierarchies had recourse to his inspiration. During a private conversation, Cardinal Frings declared that Father Rahner was the greatest theologian of the century. Rahner had had a run-in with the Holy Office over his dubious theses against the Assumption of Mary and the virginal maternity, so that Cardinal Ottaviani felt compelled to prevent this outlaw's participating in the council. All of his writings were subjected to a preventative Roman censure, as had been the case for de Lubac and Congar. However, Pope John XXIII, who had already included his French co-religionists as experts at the Preparatory Commission for the Council, welcomed Rahner with open arms after receiving a petition on his behalf from certain powerful protectors. Other notable modernists were named as experts, Schillebeek, later infamous for his Dutch catechism, Kung, Ratzinger, and Chenu. These innovators were transformed from marginal crypto-modernists into conciliar theologians by Roncalli's sleight of hand. When Rahner was named as an expert of the council, along with about 190 other theologians, he was by far the best prepared thanks to the preliminary work of his own writings. His influence at the council was such that the official commentary of the council text in German cites Rahner 95 times, Congar 67 times, St. Thomas 48 times, and de Lubac 15 times. The fact would seem to suggest that the council was interpreted in the light of Rahner's works, especially those on the church, the episcopacy, and the question of permanent deacons. Rahner had carved himself out a sphere of influence among the other theologians, over Ratzinger, his right-hand man, but also over Vergrimler, Kuhn, Boff, Metz, Lehmann, and a number of German-language bishops. They were all under his spell, according to the testimony of one of them. Asked to describe Rahner's influence on the doctrinal commission, Congar replied, Enormous! The atmosphere became Rauner Dixit Ergo Verum Est. I will give you an example. The doctrinal commission was made up of bishops, each with his own expert at his side, but also included certain superior generals of the Dominicans or the Carmelites, for instance. Now there were two microphones on the table of the commission, but Rauner practically had one of them to himself alone. Rahner was a little invasive, and, in addition, very often the cardinal from Vienna, Franz Koenig, of whom Rahner was the expert, turned toward him and invited him to intervene by saying, Rahner, quid? Naturally, Rahner intervened. In any case, he was always very interesting and often courageous. He was indeed omnipresent. 
He held conferences in the presence of the German-language bishops. He was invited by the South American bishops favorable to liberation theology. He participated in meetings between French and German theologians. He had an open invitation from the liberal cardinals, in particular Montini and Lucaro. The European alliance, united around its mastermind, quickly realized that it would not be enough to boycott the preparatory schemata, but that they would have to counterattack with replacements. Rahner himself explained to what extent the German element was well organized. These last days, I have composed in Latin a criticism of the first dogmatic schema, Lumen Gentium. This afternoon, it will be in the hands of everyone of the German bishops. The German bishops, experts, who have already printed 400 copies. Tomorrow I will have to write a summary for the South American bishops. Maybe, after all, we will obtain a good third of the votes, which will avoid the worst. Frings is optimistic. Frings is also distributing about 2,000 copies of pseudo schema fabricated by Ratzinger and me, but I think there is little hope for that one. Rahner was already influential in liturgical matters by his doctrinal justification of Kant's celebration. He now threw all his efforts into sabotaging the schemata on the sources of revelation. For if there existed a second source of revelation outside of Holy Scripture, namely oral tradition, then it would become impossible to reach an agreement with the Christians who base their faith on sola scriptura. Once short work had been made of the schema on the two sources, there remained little hope for the others. Henceforth, the council began to advance beyond anything the European alliance had ever imagined. Rahner composed new schemata on Revelation, the Blessed Virgin, and the Church in 1963 for the Conference of Fulda, of which he was the mastermind. Thanks to a carefully organized work, each of the German-speaking council fathers had been supplied with a total of 480 mimeographed pages of comment, criticism, and substitute schemata by the time he left for the second session. The Germano-European Alliance thus became the group by far the best prepared for determining the orientation of the council. The schema, De Verbum, on the sources of Revelation, gives an idea of what was at stake in the struggle, and also of the modus operandi, of the all-powerful modernists within the commission, responsible for the schema, constantly chipping away at the traditional view. Their goal was nothing less than the denial of oral tradition, as a second source of revelation, the denial of the universal inerrancy of the Holy Bible, by confining it to questions of faith and morals alone. And finally, the casting of doubt onto the historicity of the Gospels. The sacred authors wrote the four Gospels, always in such a way that they tell us true and sincere things about Jesus. The Ranarians systematically blocked all amendment in the traditional sense, until the day when Paul VI, realizing, a bit late, the underlying ambiguity, felt obliged in conscience to demand a more orthodox formulation. However, most of the equivocations remained in place. All of the major dogmatic texts on the Church, on ecumenism, on revelation, on religious liberty, were riddled with equivocal statements, cunningly inserted by the revolutionary Pariti. The schema on the Blessed Virgin was a source of considerable anxiety to Rahner since it promised to wreak havoc in the domain of ecumenism. The point which he found particularly offensive was a teaching of the schema on the mediation of the Most Blessed Virgin, more precisely her title of Mediatrix of All Graces. Rahner's diktat became manifest when he made it known that the bishops of Austria, Germany, and Switzerland should consider themselves forced to declare openly that they could not accept the schema in its present form. This victory of his Marian views established Karl Rahner as the most powerful man at the council. The council studied the theme of collegiality based on Rahner's book, Episcopacy and Primacy, 
newly re-edited by Ratzinger. Here, more than in any other text, Rahner marked the final product with his indelible stamp. He congratulated himself on it openly, considering this text to be the Council's most significant innovation. Congar confirmed the sentiment, but insisted that Rahner's interests were universal. He did not have the good fortune of collaborating, like me, in the composition of the text on ecumenism, religious liberty, where his collaboration would have been very important, and non-Christian religions within the Secretariat for the Unity of Christians. Yet he was consumed by the ecumenical desire. Number 5. The Magna Carta The Declaration of the Rights of Man had been prepared in secret conclaves long before carrying off the assent of the Revolutionary Assembly. The same was true for the Magna Carta, consecrated by Vatican II. Vatican II was not so much the starting point for a new theology as the end point, an official ratification of the neo-modernist theories. The theology which triumphed at the Council was that of the same theologians who had only been recently condemned, removed from teaching posts or sent into exile. The theology of the outcast doctors had indeed triumphed across the board. As a general rule, the conciliar texts were not openly heretical, or they would have never received the approval of the conciliar assembly. Schillebeek, complaining of a particular text as too openly conservative, was assured that the drafters had expressed themselves diplomatically. After the council, they would draw all of the implicit conclusions. The texts were simply ambiguous, thus constituting, in reality, so many time bombs. The three most important time bombs of our modernist pyrotechnicians correspond perfectly with the revolutionary trilogy, liberty, equality, fraternity. We have sufficiently addressed the question of ecumenism, the conciliar equivalent of revolutionary fraternity. It remains for us to speak of the debates on religious liberty and collegiality. Religious liberty, treated in the Declaration Dignitatis Humanae, was the object of heated debate, even before the opening of the Council. Cardinal Ottaviani, bulldog of the faith, defended the freedom of the Catholic religion, which in certain circumstances may lead to the toleration of error. Cardinal Bea, on the contrary, spoke of the freedom of religions and granted freedom in principle to all faiths, as exercise in public as well as in private. Such a theory amounted to granting rights to error and vice, according to the American dream of Father John Courtney Murray, condemned by the Holy Office prior to his victory at the Council. The absurd character of such a right is flagrant in the intervention of Archbishop Botida. It is necessary to accept the danger of error. One cannot embrace the truth without having a certain experience of error. It is therefore necessary to speak of the right to seek error and to err. I call out for liberty for the conquest of truth. Pius IX, however, had already cast anathemas against those who affirm that freedom of conscience and of worship is a right proper to every man, or that the best condition of society is one in which the government does not have the right to punish the violation of the Catholic religion by legal censures unless necessitated by public order. Precisely what Pius IX condemned, Vatican II affirmed in the Declaration Dignitatis Humanae. The person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom consists in this, that in matter of religion, no one should be prevented from acting according to his conscience, in private or in public, alone or in association with others, within just limits. Congar could not refrain from admitting that such a text was in fairly strict contradiction with Propositions 15 and 17 through 19 of the syllabus of 1864. How could the modernists justify their innovation? By pretending that the condemnation was valid for the 19th century, but was not valid in perpetuity. For, according to Murray, Vatican II represents a continuity in the evolution of the traditional teaching. It is as though, one fine autumn day, 
our Lord suddenly changed his mind and decided he would no longer reign on earth. Before the hue and cry of a number of council fathers, the Pope, to break the standoff, decided to add a textual note, claiming that nothing in the text contradicted tradition. These blithe words, which changed nothing, were the spoonful of sugar allowing the liberal revolution to go down without a protest. Moreover, let us not imagine that such quarrels were mere hair-splitting. Thanks to religious liberty, the last of the Catholic nations, Spain, Colombia, certain Swiss cantons, and Italy, found themselves obliged to laicize the state. Thanks to religious liberty, divorce has now invaded these countries. Thanks to religious liberty, children are no longer entitled to learn that they have a father in heaven who loves them. Thanks to religious liberty, sex and new religious movements offer an easy way out to Catholics thrown off balance by the conciliar whirlwind. Thanks to religious liberty, more than 60 million Catholics in South America have already apostatized. Are these the abundant fruits of the Council? Welcome does the springtime of the Church? Equality completes the triptych of the Masonic Magna Carta of the Rights of Man. In religious terms, equality signifies the democratization of the formerly monolithic Church. Our divine Redeemer created the Church by founding it on Peter. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my Church. Rahner, on the contrary, was to propose the collegial doctrine, according to which the Pope is but the equal of the bishops, primus inter pares. His function would be limited to playing the policeman, to keep order among the other members, with a synarchic and no longer a monarchic power, according to a thesis condemned by the Church. Thus, on October 30th, 1963, the Council voted in favor of collegiality, which invited the Pope to share the government of the Church with the bishops. Congar declared, triumphant, that the Church had carried off her October revolution. Though often warned of their perverse intentions, the Pope had left the drafters free reign until the day when one of the experts committed the supreme indiscretion of putting in writing the interpretation which the modernists planned to draw from the ambiguous passages once the Council had ended. This paper fell into the hands of the conservatives, who carried it to the Pope. Pope Paul, finally understanding that he had been fooled, was greatly moved and wept. It was on this occasion that he said to Cardinal Ruffini, summoned in haste one evening of November 1964, Eminence, save the council, save the council! He shuddered and wept. Soni i pariti che fanno il concilio. We have to rally! in the face of mutiny of these employees. What could be done to rectify an ambiguous text that laid waste to the divine constitution of the Church but was accepted by the Council Fathers? The Pope ordered an appendix to be included in a nota explicativa previa, which included the heretical interpretation. The Catholic doctrine had been saved in extremis, at least as regards the constitution of the Church, Nonetheless, the addition of such a note will ever remain a mute but eloquent testimony to the ambiguity of the conciliar texts. It is evident that these democratizing theories could only bear bitter fruit. The personal authority of the bishops was henceforth torn between the authority of the Pope and that of the powerful Episcopal conferences, a situation that threatened to ruin the Church. Bishops saw their authority melting into that of the Episcopal conferences. As an individual bishop, I am absolutely powerless. Matters have been so arranged in the Church today that an appeal by a bishop would be ridiculed as well as going unheard. Almost all synods, diocesan or national, have tended to assert their independence and taken up ideas and made proposals at odds with the stated policy of the Holy See, requesting such things as the 
ordination of married men and of women, Eucharistic communion with separated Christian brethren, and the admission of bigamous, divorced people to the sacraments, the synods of the German and the Swiss bishops. Vatican Council II, in the words of Cardinal Suenens, was the 1789 of the Church, the revolution sought by John the Twenty Third, according to the Freemason Mar Sedan. Congar perhaps best defined the accomplishments of Vatican II. The Council liquidated what I would call the unconditionality of the system. By system, I mean the extremely coherent whole made up of the ideas communicated by the teaching of the Roman universities, codified by canon law, protected by a strict and reasonably effective surveillance under Pius XII, with accounts rendered, calls to order, submission of writings to the Roman censor, etc. In a word, a system. The council disintegrated all that. What Conger calls the unconditionality of the system includes the revealed deposit, the faith, the sacraments, and the jurisdiction of the Catholic Church, the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth, which alone holds the promises of eternal life. The man who had, for years, been awaiting the opportunity to put dynamite under the seats of the scribes could well rejoice to see the Church renounce its mission of preserving the deposit of faith and of teaching Urbi et Orbi, the faith and the means of salvation. Like the child who takes a perverse pleasure in destroying, it seems that Congar had no greater joy in life than that of witnessing the dilapidation of the treasure of the church and the destruction of the unity of the mystical body of Christ. After the council, the revolutionaries had the good sense to seal their victory by preventing any return to the old order. Paul VI affirmed Vatican Council II to be, under certain aspects, more important than the Council of Nicaea. Whoever today considers the Council to have been merely pastoral is treated as a heretic and schismatic. However, the Theological Commission certainly went to enough pains to insist on the non-dogmatic character of the Council. Might it not be infallible after all? since it has all the earmarks of the universal ordinary magisterium? It could at first glance come as a surprise that the neo-modernist theologians who, on the eve of the council, detested the universal ordinary magisterium, should today be its greatest advocates and invoke its authority at the drop of a hat. But that was before the storming of the Bastille. Henceforth, the fundamentalists, have been chained and scorned as leprous, which has created, de facto, a universal modernist consensus. The revolutionaries can therefore celebrate the universal ordinary magisterium, holding it up as infallible after the definition of Vatican I, in order to grant the seal of infallibility to the heresies of the modernists. However, they are getting a little ahead of themselves because... Unless one has the mental schemes of a hardcore modernist, the universal magisterium cannot contradict itself and remain infallible. Are we facing an insoluble dilemma? On the contrary, the solution is very simple. Universality in the context of magisterium does not signify mere unanimity in space, but also in time. According to the canon of Lorenz, Quod semper et ubique, always and everywhere. Take the character of perpetuity away from infallibility, and nothing remains to prevent the church from falling prisoner to an ideological mass movement, imposing its errors by means of a pressure group. This is precisely what occurred at Vatican II, and not only at Vatican II. The post-conciliar era is every bit as modernist, with Paul VI, Ratzinger, and John Paul II, flying the same ecumenical colors saluted at the council. The following chapters will confirm this by a detailed study of these three authorities within what has been so aptly named the Conciliar Church.